Welcome, everyone. Uh, thrilled that you're all here. Uh, thrilled that we have the uh, esteemed honorable Senator Ed Markey. Uh, welcome to the second talk of this fall term in the Environmental Solutions Initiative's People on the Planet lecture series. I'm John Fernandez. I'm a professor here at MIT, and I'm the director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative. Uh, Ed, Senator Markey's talk, uh, Combating Climate Crisis from Regulation to Legislation. Um, Senator Markey, uh, as consumer champion and national leader on climate change, energy, environmental protection, telecommunication policy, and he has a prolific legislative record on major issues across the policy spectrum and a deep commitment to improving the lives of the people of Massachusetts and our country. In the House of Representatives, Congressman Markey served as the ranking member of the Natural Resources Committee from 2007 to 2010. He served as chairman of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, a signature committee established by then Speaker Nancy Pelosi. He also served on the Energy and Commerce Committee, where he was chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment. He's the principal House author of the 2007 Fuel Economy Law. He's also the author of the Appliance Efficiency Act of 1987, which, by the way, stopped the construction of hundreds of coal-fired power plants. In 2009, Congressman Markey was the co-author of the landmark Waxman-Markey Bill, the only comprehensive climate legislation ever to pass a chamber of Congress. After 37 years in the House of Representatives, Senator Markey was elected to the Senate in 2013. Senator Markey's visit to MIT continues the commitment of the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative and the Institute as a whole to bring to campus key voices on the challenges of climate change. This commitment is focused on contributing in every way possible, including on our campus with the Climate Action Plan, to a sustainable world through the combination of technical means and policy intelligence. We will continue to advance MIT's role in addressing the ever daunting consequences of climate change, and we hope to engage all of you in future events and projects. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Se Senator Markey to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, so much. Thank all of you for coming out here on Friday afternoon at 4.10 in the afternoon. And that is no small commitment to uh, this huge issue. Um, it's my honor to be here. Um, I grew up and still live three miles from here in Malden. My father drove a truck for the Hood Milk Company. Uh, my mother uh, didn't want me to drive a truck. Uh, and so when she was disappointed in me when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, which was not infrequently, she would say, Eddie, your father and I are going to donate your brain <laughs> to MIT as a completely unused human organ. <laughs> and she would say, she would say, this immediately after she had said, you have to learn how to work smarter, not harder, or as we say here in Massachusetts, smarter and not harder. And, uh, and that's what you're all about. You're about sustainability. You're all about renewables. You're all about energy efficiency. You're all about working smarter and not harder. So. Uh, I'm joined here by my great friend and uh, up until last year, for about 20 years, the head of the Environmental League of Massachusetts, George Backrack. He has joined us here today. Uh, he was the quarterback from Massachusetts for all these years, and his wife, Susan, uh, is here as well. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a new state representative just elected, uh, Maria Robinson who is a scientist, and she is and an alum of MIT, and she's going to be a freshman state representative. A little bit of MIT science. MIT science, okay? Never hurt, you know? Um, so we thank you for that. A terrible thing happened to me when I was uh, about 14 years old. 
uh, President Kennedy said that he was going to put uh, a man on the moon uh, in seven years and have them return safely. Uh, and that was the, uh, the mission to the moon. Uh, but uh, it was a call, a generational call for all of us to now lift our gaze to the constellation of possibilities for ourselves, for our nation, and for the world. But unfortunately for me, they also gave a contract to MIT to develop something called new math. Now, this wasn't good for me because they picked five high school classes around here to be the guinea pigs, and they picked the 35 boys in the A class at Malden Catholic, which I was in, to be amongst those five boys. And so Brother Bede would come over here at night, like every Sunday night, and they would give them the next chapter in the new math. And then he would come into class the next day. And it was great for Tommy Murphy, amongst the 35 boys. He was going to go to MIT on a full scholarship. And it was good for John Piaccioni and Bobby Daly, who's out at Los Alamos last night, uh, right now. It's, it was great for about 10 or 15 of the future history majors. Not so good. Not so good. <laughs> so, but we were part of the future. I knew I was part of the future. Brother Bede would say, he'd hold up the chapter, and he said, it's called SMSG. Some math, some garbage. Our job, boys, find the garbage <laughs> so we can help MIT. Well, that was great for Tommy Murphy, but I felt I was part of that great adventure. And it was my great honor when I got elected to Congress 42 years ago, uh, and Tip O'Neill said to me, which committee do you want to be on? Well, that was my focus. So I wanted to be on the telecommunications subcommittee, on the energy and environment subcommittee, on the healthcare subcommittee, the technology committees. Because my focus was out to Route 128. Boston and Cambridge were still old cities with old industries. So the future was out on Route 128. Now all those old industries have died, so now all of the, old, the, 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 uh, the companies are moving here. But they're moving here just because the real estate cleared out and we know that millennials want to be cool and on the orange line of the green line, right? So we're down here now. But it wasn't as though the future wasn't already here. It was. We just called it Route 128. And so that was my focus in Congress. What are those issues? How do we kind of move to the future? So uh, right now, um, we're challenged like we've never been challenged before. And so what I try to do is to make sure I'm always armed uh, with the smartest people who are working for me. And on my staff right now, I have a AAAS fellow, Dr. Michelle Bustamante, who was a postdoc associate at MIT in 2016 to 2018 in the materials systems lab, uh, material need uh, for the future sustainable energy systems. And, uh, and Michelle, where are you? So you can just stand up and you can see that I, I hang around with very smart MIT people all day long on my staff, so thank you. Michelle, for being here. So, Massachusetts is the Bay State, but we're also the Brain State. So it wasn't lost on me when I started in Congress that President Kennedy had asked Jerome Wiesner, the president of MIT, to be his science advisor. We all knew that when we were kids. The president had the president of MIT walking around. He was talking to him about nuclear arms control, strontium-90 coming down from nuclear blast. He was, they actually passed the first Clean Air Act in 1963. People don't know that. That's what the 1970 law was based upon, that first one. People don't know these things about what MIT was bringing into the White House. President Eisenhower had his science advisor advisor in some kind of witness protection program. No one knew his name, okay? But all of a sudden, it's being glorified. Science is important. So we know that the science is clear on climate change. Um, uh, now we have 70% of all Americans uh, who agree with the Paris Agreement. Uh, we all know that when the president says that he wants to change the Paris Agreement so we get better terms, well, we already have great terms. Terms. It's called wind, and solar, all electric vehicles, sustainable energy technologies, new metals. We already know what the terms are, and we already know that we can be the leader and that we can 
tell the rest of the world that this is something which is achievable. However, we also know that 16 of the last 17 years are the hottest years ever recorded in uh, the history of the world. We know that there's been a 1.8 degree warming since the year 1900. Uh, we know that, um, that by the year uh, 2030, that um, for 210 days a year, um, Mar-a-Lago will be underwater and then be Mara Lagoon. Now, you would think that Donald Trump would recognize that every time he visits as the water is splashing over the highway right outside his house, but we all know that that's incontrovertibly true as well. Uh, we know that there's been a doubling of the species which have been lost. We know that upwards of $500 billion annually could be lost. Uh, and we know that it could be a loss of upwards of 10% of the GDP of the United States by the year 2100. How do we know this? We know because the United Nations uh, have just issued a report which makes it incontrovertibly clear that it is in fact, a consensus of scientists around the planet and our own United States government scientists have released a report saying that it is incontrovertibly true as well. Now, there's a deficiency from the president's perspective on these reports because unlike him, they did not receive their degrees from Trump University um, uh, on climate science with the diploma handed out by the Koch brothers. Huh? So, that is the challenge which we are faced with, that you have a consensus among scientists on these issues, but if we don't act, then we have big problems. Now, we're about a mile right now from the second fastest warming body of water on the planet, the Gulf of Maine. That's where we live. It's the Arctic and us. We are the scene of the crime. We are the evidence that there is a rapid warming of the planet and that we are vulnerable. And we see it. We know it is occurring here. But again, the president and his all-star team at the Department of Energy, at the EPA, if you can only imagine, we get rid of Scott Pruitt and we get the chief lobbyist for the coal industry to run the EPA. I mean, who would think that anyone would ever name the chief lobbyist for the coal industry as the head of the Environmental Protection Agency? It might as well be called every polluter's ally, right? What, what is the point, right? So you have this incredible takeover by the Koch brothers, by the coal industry uh, of those things that those agencies which we know should be um, at the center of the answers to the challenges which we are being confronted with. So, uh, this is my 42nd year. I actually gave a speech to the Democratic National Convention. I, I was unhappy with the direction which the Carter administration was going. Uh, they were going to pretty much tear down the Rocky Mountains and mine it for uh, for uh, fuel from, uh, from shale, and that was President Carter's um, energy independence plan. And uh, I didn't like that idea, to be honest with you. There were about 65 of us out of 435 that voted no on that. Uh, can you imagine if we had ever gone through with that plan? It did pass the House, it did pass the Senate, but the financing mechanism collapsed in 1981 or 82. So in 1980, at the Democratic National Convention, Teddy Kennedy was running, and he gave me 10 minutes on Tuesday night of the convention to address the, the Democratic Convention 38 years ago on an alternative vision. And it was a solar and wind and electric vehicle solution by the year 2030 in the United States, a 50-year plan for us to reach it. Okay? So that was my address to the Democratic National Convention in July of 1980. Now, we didn't anticipate an actor from Southern California becoming president, to be honest with you. Uh, only about six months later, he took the solar panels off the roof of the White House, uh, and we were then 
in a battle to fight for the programs which we needed, but not in the best of environments. However, as Dr. Fernandez said, in 1987, I passed the first appliance efficiency bill. And I knew my mother was happy because what is this building? It's air conditioning, right? It's refrigeration, it's stoves, it's toasters. That's what's populating. That's why we need coal burning plants. That's why we need nuclear power plants, right? But we wouldn't need them if we were more efficient. So what my 1987 law calls for is ongoing rulemakings on air conditioning standards for our country. SEER 10, Seasonal Energy Efficiency 10, or Seasonal Energy Efficiency Rating 11, or 12, or 13. Each one is adding another 15% to the efficiency, right? It's called SEER 13. So uh, overall, it's probably avoided 200 coal burning plants ever having to have been built because it's so much more efficient. Think about it this way. In the South, in Texas, in the summer, 80% of all electricity demand, peak demand, is air conditioning. You improve that by 75%, you've changed the whole course of how we're going to generate electricity across the whole cell. Well, that's the law. Now, it's working smarter, not harder. Thank you, Ma. I'm here at MIT again, Ma, and I'm explaining to him how much I listen to you. But that's the way to go, and that's still the law, by the way. So all of it's much more efficient. Uh, the, the standards um, that we have for automobiles. So back in the 90s, and this is through Jerome Wiesner. I was over here at the Media Lab with Jerome Wiesner in 1989. I was the chairman of the Telecommunications Committee. And I, I wish that you could have all known Jerome Wiesner. Uh, you, uh, you knew that you were in the presence of greatness uh, and brilliance when you were with him. So he... Uh, he told me as the chairman of telecommunications, my job was to move America from analog to digital, from narrowband to broadband, and I had to pass the laws. So I passed three laws that culminated in the 1996 Telecommunications Act, where not one home had broadband in 1996. Uh, and that unleashed what is called the dot-com bubble, but what I call is the broadband revolution. I don't care if pets.com makes it, okay? Google did, and eBay and Amazon, but I don't care who wins. All I want is a broadband revolution. Well, that also makes possible a smart grid revolution, because you need the first revolution to create the second revolution. If you're going to revolutionize the way in which we bring electricity in off the ocean, or off the prairies, or off of roofs, if we're going to have remote control capacity to turn off air conditioning in people's homes, you need the revolution. If you're going to be transporting the energy in more efficient ways, you need the telecom revolution. So I authored that first revolution. Thank you, Dr. Wiesner. And then Nancy Pelosi said to me in 2006 I that she wanted to create a select committee on energy independence and global warming and asked me, could I pass the bills that um, are the equivalent of what I had done in the 90s on telecom? So I took on that assignment. So in 2007, uh, the first law was fuel economy standards. There had not been a new law since 1975 on fuel economy standards. The average for an American vehicle was 25 miles per gallon. That was the average for the whole fleet. So in December of, and we took over, the Democrats took over, control of the House and Senate. It had been in Republican control since 1994. Newt Gingrich, not big on technological innovation. So we went from 94 to 2006. We want it back again. I'm now the chairman, House and Senate. Bush is still president. We got the votes. So Nancy Pelosi and I stood over his shoulder in December of 2007 when he signed the bill to dramatically increase the fuel economy standards of the vehicles which we're driving. So now Elon Musk and others can say, look at how high the standard has to go. We're going to need new metals. We're going to need new technologies. We have to stop moving. You can go to the capital markets and raise money if you can see what the law is now mandating. But Bush didn't promulgate the regulations, but it was the law. So in 2009, when Obama took over, what Obama did 
was he took my law and he took uh, the California waiver to the Clean Air Act. He put it together. The industry was actually collapsing because of the financial crisis. And the rule promulgated 54.5 miles per gallon by the year 2025, the largest single reduction in greenhouse gases of any law that had ever passed in any country in our history. And I'm very proud of that. Now, Audi is now bragging about their all electric vehicles. Every company's got electric vehicles now, right? Or plug-in hybrids, you name it, all the way down the line, just showing how much progress they're all making because it's the law. But Trump is now announcing he's going to roll back the regulation, reduce the incentive. And of course, they're hearing that in other countries. Why should we do it? You can't preach, you can't preach temperance from a bar stool. You can't have a cigar in your, in your, in your mouth and a beer in your hand and saying, and Joey, you know, Marie, make sure you never drink or smoke. It just doesn't work that way, huh? You have to be doing it yourself. So he's just sending this wrong signal, even as 700,000 new auto workers have been hired since 2010, you know, in this climate of innovation. Uh, and I was there in 1979 when Chrysler needed a bailout. And then I'm really honored to say that I was there in 2009 when I had a vote to bail out Chrysler the second time. And I'm getting afraid I might have to vote the third time to bail them out because they're not moving to the future, to the challenge, to the opportunity. You have to keep reteaching the same lessons over and over and over again. And in 2009, what we did was we built in to the stimulus bill 90 billion dollars, let me say that again, 90 billion dollars for wind, for solar, for battery technologies, all of these new technologies in the stimulus bill. Now, Solyndra went under, yes, but it's not a Solyndra revolution any more than it's a pets.com revolution. The job was to just have Dozens, scores of new companies getting into these areas. Some are going to win, some are going to lose. But what's our goal? Our goal is to cut the price of solar for the consumer in half, and then cut the price for solar in half, and then cut the price for solar in half in the same way that we had moved from an analog phone, which was 50 cents a minute, and it was the size of a Gordon Gecko phone in Wall Street, in three years, after I moved over 200 megahertz for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license in 1993, by 1996, everyone had a phone in their pocket. It was a flip phone. It was under 10 cents a minute. It was digital, and we were off on the revolution. Right? I don't know which company wins. I don't even care. We're indifferent to the company who gets rich. All we want is a whole bunch of people at the Sloan School that think they can get rich. right? <laughs> and then they hire you to figure out how to do it. I don't know, okay? All I know is we need Republicans to get the money so the Democratic scientists can do their work, okay? <laughs> and then who wins? I really don't care. I'm indifferent to that, right? I'm an agnostic, but I know that's the formula. It's ultimately Darwinian paranoia-inducing capitalism once you set up that market. And $1 trillion went into that broadband revolution between 1996 and 2000, right? It flooded it and transformed the country. Today, a kid thinks a 50-inch interactive HD screen is a constitutional right, right? They have no idea <laughs> that up until 96, we were analog and no one had any of it, right? Okay. It's just a totally different set of expectations and no one would want to go back to the past. So that then induced paranoia in China. I went with Nancy Pelosi in May of 2000 May of, 19, uh, May of 2009, um, Henry Waxman, who was a congressman from California and I, passed the Waxman-Markey bill. That called for an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by the year 2050, 17% by, um, by uh, 2020, et cetera, et cetera, out to 2050. Passed 219, 212 in the House, uh, and then it went over to the Senate. We did not know, ultimately, that Mitch McConnell would be so successful in killing it. 
But that's the template. That bill will always be the template because it already passed in terms of what our goals are for renewables, what our goals are for farming, for the steel industry, all of it. Automotive industry, it's all in that bill. And it passed 219 to 212. Well, we flew to China. You ready for this? This is unbelievable. We land in China. We're going to meet with President Hu like two weeks later. And I don't know if you've ever been to Beijing, but we've, we rode in from the airport in our bus. No traffic all the way from the airport. The next morning, we got up to meet with uh, President Hu. No traffic in downtown Beijing at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then we met with President Hu for two hours as he's asking us what's in the waxman Markey bill. And we explained the goals for wind, for solar, for all electric vehicles. Hmm, took it all in. Because he's, their leader is kind of like the CEO and the president of the country, if you know what I'm saying. I wouldn't want to challenge our leader to be able to answer questions, you know, of that nature on any one of the individual component parts of legislation. That's not how they work over there. That's when they started to flood the market with more money for solar, for electric vehicles. They could see our plan. You know, we don't have to be afraid of China, but you're not going to beat them without a plan. You got to have a plan. Because they, their plan they can implement almost overnight. So that's just the nature of the business. So when Waxman Markey passed, um, a great wave of optimism went around our country. There were some people unhappy with the concessions that we might have made to the steel industry, to the utility industry. Um, but you need the votes. Somebody ran up to Adlai Stevenson in 1956 and said, Adlai, Adlai, great news. Every thinking voter is with you. And he said, that's great. He said, but I need a majority. Okay, so, <laughs> so you have to work with industries. You've got to give them a pathway. You've got to make it possible for them to see that they're not going to go out of business, that there's a transition, and we're going to help them to make that transition. So now um, we have a president. Uh, who is in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry, of the deniers. Uh, and he's more interested in 50,000 coal miners as a political metaphor than he is in what can unfold for the future. So, for all intents and purposes, there was really no solar and wind industry 10 or 12 years ago. It was about 1% of all electrical generation in the United States, about 1%. Today, in uh, 2020, in 2018, we're going to have 20,000 new megawatts of wind and solar deployed in the United States. So Seabrook's 1,000 megawatts up there, Pilgrim's 1,000 megawatts, 20,000 megawatts. Last year was 20,000 megawatts. Next year's going to be 20,000 megawatts. We now have 250,000 employees in the wind and solar industry. Now, who are they? Well, they're carpenters. They're roofers. They're electricians. It's the largest single blue-collar job-creating revolution in two generations. At the current pace, we're going to have 500,000 in the wind and solar industry by 2020. We will have 250,000 megawatts of wind and solar combined by 2022, got that number again? 250,000 megawatts, up from almost nothing just 12 years ago. Why did we not have a better start? Ronald well, Reagan took the solar panels off the roof, 1981. We could have been here a lot earlier. Liberals are usually right, but too soon. So you, gotta, you just got to <laughs> accept. You got to accept how long it takes sometimes for us to win. Sometimes it's not all, it's not invincible ignorance, but it's difficult to confront ignorance, right? You have to just keep working. So we all like, we believe in science, okay? Kind of hard concept. And uh, for many people in the Congress, uh, but uh, you know, there's an old saying in politics that it's hard to understand something when you're paid not to understand it. So they all go to fine universities, many of these Republicans. They go to Harvard, they go to Duke. They go to Stanford, but then they get down there and they told, oh, no, 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 stop using your brain, you know? We can't vote for a sustainable future, right? 
we're being paid here by the Koch brothers not to do any thinking, right? That's the bottom line. There's a whole web of deceit. You know, the Heartland Institute, I don't know if you know this group, but a particularly odious group, they actually last year sent out 250,000 um, books to um, the 250,000 science high school and grammar school teachers in America on the other side of the science of climate change, if you can believe that. So there's a huge multi-hundred million dollar industry out there that's working against us uh, to deliberately disseminate all of this erroneous information uh, and intimidate teachers, uh, intimidate people who will want to stand up but who won't want to get into the fight. So I think our message here is uh, that we want to engage in massive job creation, blue collar job creation, to save all of creation. And we're not only not shy about it, but we're aggressive about it. That this is an MIT blue collar partnership to invent the future, right? To invent the future. So that's why I'm here, because leadership is really being a voice for the future. And that's who you are. You're the future. You're the future. When I was a, when I was a boy, uh, it was a great singer, Judy Collins. Judy Collins had a great, great song. It was called Pass It On. Pass It On. Here are the lyrics. Freedom never came like a bird on the wing. Never came down like a rain in the spring. Freedom, freedom, what a hard-won thing. You've got to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation has got to win it again. So that's where we are. Okay. We're going to build on what has already happened. We know what still has to be done. And we need our own intergenerational compact here that we all work together to just keep building towards what we know has to be done. Because Donald Trump's building a new intergenerational compact on the other side. And you can see his young people at his rallies, all clapping so hard that it's bruising the palms of their hands. And it's almost unbelievable that you can look at these young people and think that they're doing it. But they're there. So we're going to win. We always win in the end. But you have to fight for it in each generation. There's no final battle. So in Congress this year, um, we're going to have a big battle, and uh, we have a lot of issues that we're going to need your help on. Uh, we're going to have an infrastructure bill. The president wants an infrastructure bill. I'm on the Environment and Infrastructure Committee. But he's going to want an infrastructure bill with no environmental standards, like it's 1955 and Eisenhower's building a, a road across America with a big white line down the middle of it, as though we're not going to think about the environment again. But it's not 1955, it's 2018. So if we're going to have an infrastructure bill, we're going to have to have high environmental standards that are attached to it. And we're going to need you as part of this effort, you know, making sure that our arguments are heard and that we can do it. See, that's a big part of what this is all about. We know that we can do it. We're also going to have a big battle over tax, over, over a tax bill. So next year, Trump and uh, the Republicans in the Senate are going to want to pass a tax bill. But we now control the House of Representatives. And we still have 47 Democrats in the Senate. So if he's going to want tax breaks for what he wants, we're going to want tax breaks for wind. We're going to want tax breaks for solar. We're going to want tax breaks for um, for energy efficiency, for batteries, all the way down the line. And we're going to want them to stay on the books for as long as their tax breaks stay on the books. Otherwise, they get no tax breaks, because now, over in the House of Representatives, we can say no. 
And so we're going to need you to be part of that fight. So you can be explaining what happens if those rules, those laws, those tax breaks are on the books. What are the changes? What can it look like? First, what is the danger if we don't? And then what happens if we actually invest in a solution? Huh? Science on both sides, right? And dramatically laying out what those problems are. And what I'm seeing is that the president thinks that he can make America great again by making America hate again. You know, we saw that in Pittsburgh, in the synagogue. Huh? And we know hate doesn't belong in a synagogue, and neither does an AK-47. We know that, huh? Just doesn't. But it's scientists as well. He just, he builds this hatred, right? And hatred leads to harm. And the people in this room have to then be the answer, which is hope. You know? And we can do it. We can do it. But we're going to need you to step up. Because hope doesn't come just from hope. Hope comes from action. Action is what actually produces the hope. Organization is what creates the hope. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. And President Kennedy used to say, to those who much is given, much is expected. Well, the people in this room have been given more than all but a half of a half of a half of 1% of all the people who have ever lived in the history of the world just by being in this room. You're the most special people that we have, not just here, but from around the world. So we're going to need you to be leaders. We're going to need you to step up and participate in this counterinsurgency that began on Election Day, but it's not finished. It's not finished. And you also know, at the same time, the time is running out. That this planet is so dangerously warming that the intensification is so much greater than we had thought it was just five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, that we have to telescope the time frame that it's going to take for us to take the action which is necessary. And that's who you are. So. Leadership is being a voice for the future. And you are the future of our country. And you must play that role. You have to ensure that <clears throat> the leadership in our community here is the leadership for the whole country. You have disproportionate clout because you are MIT. You walk in with a calling card that's the size of a telephone book. It just says MIT and your ability as a result to change the way people think about issues is so much dramatically higher than anyone else that you have to use it. This is the time, this is the place, you are the people. Uh, you're very special, but this is a very special time. President Trump's trying to roll back 50 years of science, 50 years of American history. Uh, and you stand on the shoulders of Jerome Wiesner and all those preceding generations of brilliant people who here got us to this point. But this journey is not over. And we need an intergenerational compact so we get that extra energy, that extra brain power. So I thank you all for inviting me here to uh, MIT. You have no idea what it means to me. And uh, with your work, I promise you, uh, we can do this. Uh, we are going to save the planet, and we're going to do it by inventing the technologies that are going to do it and then making sure the whole rest of the world gets them. I'm looking forward to partnering with you. And if you want, I can take a few questions. But thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. How was that? So, um, so we're, we're, we're on a tight timeline, and I do want to have um, Several questions asked. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. If you're going to ask a question, please line up at the microphones. Please introduce yourself. One question per person. No long statements, please. First question. Can I say this? What I like about MIT is the questions come in the form of answers. Okay, that's the that's the beauty of being over here. You know, you, you, yes, ma'am. 
I'll try not to do that. Can you just speak up a little bit? Yes. So, Corey Alperstein, I'm from Newton. I'm not um, a graduate M of MIT, but I am a dedicated climate activist and a mother of two children, and I am terrified for the future. Um, I feel that you as a leader have done phenomenal work over several decades, and I applaud you for that work, but we're looking in a different time frame now, and it's an urgent one. And um, I feel that you have to lead in very dramatic ways. So the first question that I have um, to get us going here is why have you not signed the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge? I know this question was asked to you in Belmont at our town meeting, a number of other people. I personally wrote an email to you. You mentioned being in the pocket of fossil fuel industry, you, how money uh, corrupts right. politics. We, we need you to stand up for us literally and symbolically, right. and uh, I'd love no, to I hear your answer. Saying. Yeah, no, I got it. I, I just. Is there any evidence that a fossil fuel company would be stupid enough to give me any money? I don't know that that exists, but um, no, I'm not taking money from the fossil fuel industry. I, I, so I, you, you have in the past. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. So you're no, going to take the there pledge? Will be, there will be no Exxon Mobil pack or shell pack. So is that in, a yes, you will take the pledge? I should, excuse me? Is that a yes, you will take the pledge? I just did. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, yeah. No. I, I. I. What I'm saying to you is, I. There's no evidence that, that. Um. If. If you're, if you're a fossil fuel company and you're giving money to me, then whoever the lobbyist is should be retired immediately. Okay. That's all I'm saying to you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Uh, first, I just want to thank you so much for your leadership on the issues. Um, Contrary to others, I know for a fact you're not taking fossil fuel packs because of all the measures that you've taken for decades now uh, on these issues. Uh, and unfortunately, I know with the lame duck session. Can Senate, you just move up the microphone yeah. a little bit? Yeah. So you can hear better. Yeah. Better. Um, I know, unfortunately, with the lame duck session in Congress, it's a challenge for you and some other senators to make it over to Poland this year for COP24. Um, and I know some aides will be attending, but I was just curious uh, given that governors, mayors, people in other positions have had to signed the Paris Agreement in some degree to make pacts uh, when the federal government has not been there. Uh, what would you impart on people who are attending COP24 and uh, those who will be involved in this year's signing of the rule book? For... Signing, I'm sorry, signing of? So this year, the negotiations will be signing the Paris Agreement rule book. So as a senator and someone who is working within uh, the administration to try and get them to sign something, what would you impart on uh, myself, others who will be attending, uh, and also governors on what to do at COP24 this year? Ah, great. Okay. So, so the, uh, the meeting is going to be in Poland next week. That is, the world is coming together. So in 2009, when Obama went to Copenhagen, what he did was he took the 17% pledge reduction that was in the Waxman-Markey bill and had already passed the House. It hadn't passed the Senate yet. There was still another year to go, and we thought that we could get it done. So what he did was he took the 17% pledge in the Waxman-Markey bill that Henry and I had selected and then that's the pledge he made to the world, a 17% reduction by the year 2020. Now, we're going to be close to that. We might not make it, but just because of the policies that Obama put in place and what has happened at the cities and the states and the private sector moving, we're, we're moving um, rapidly towards that goal being met. But if you look out at 2025 or 2030, our goals are, are retreating. So what we need to do, uh, and that's what happened uh, last year when we went to Paris, uh, Jerry Brown, the governor of California, Mike Bloomberg, the former mayor of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of New York, and a Medford High School graduate. Um, and by the way, Mayor de, Mayor de Blasio is a graduate of Cambridge Range in Latin. I don't know why New York City can't have its own public school system, produce mayors for them, but we've been doing it for the last 20 years. But um, they were there, and, he, and I spoke with um, Jerry Brown and, um, uh, and with uh, Mike Bloomberg at a huge conference that we had there. And our message was, we're still in it, even though the Trump administration officials were walking around saying that we're not in it. And our pledge was able to be made by our corporations, by our cities, 
by our states and by the members of Congress and the Senate who were there saying, we're going to stop any bad legislation from passing. We can't perhaps pass good legislation, but we're going to stop anything bad from passing. So I think that it's important for the world to know that we're still in it. MIT's still in it, Caltech's still in it, Harvard's still in it. Um, all across this country, we're committed to meeting this goal. So any and all pledges which can be signed, should be signed, uh, so that we're making that commitment uh, to the world. Uh, because Poland's not going to be necessarily a good thing. The more that we're backing away, you might have seen the story in the New York Times on Sunday about how many more coal burning plants are now being built in India, in China. You can't preach temperance from a bar stool. You have to have a leader. Uh, but that, that notwithstanding, uh, we can still get this done. Uh, and it's, it's going to take another election, but we can turn this around very quickly. And as you know, you cannot pull out of the Paris Agreement until November of 2020. That's in the agreement. You can say you're going to pull out, but you can't pull out until November of 2020. Now, what else happens in November of 2020? <laughs> okay, so it gives us, if you would, if you would just, uh, you know, give us the next two years, it gives us a good, very good target date, huh? To tell them that the whole of the U.S. government is in it. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, uh, my name is. Can Mel you speak up? Yeah, please. Oh, yes, uh, my name is Malcolm Cummings from Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm an engineer in the solar industry. Beautiful. And um, yeah, I love that line you had about blue-collar job creation for saving all creation. Thank you. And uh, yeah, to that history um, major, <laughs> majors. Okay, what's your major? I'm sorry. What was your major? Uh, aerospace engineering. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> answers, answers. I have questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but yeah, to that point, I was uh, wondering if you had a public uh, opinion on the uh, the proposal to create a select new committee for the Green New Deal in Congress. Um, I know it's not uh, your chamber, but uh, I know well, again, our, our I representative supports it. Right. Uh, I was the chairman of it. <laughs> <laughs> I invented that committee. I had yeah. 80 hearings, plus I was the chairman of the Energy Subcommittee on the Energy uh, committee, so I was able to then pass the legislation. Uh, so, so that was a concept that Nancy Pelosi and I created back for 2007, 8, 9, and 10. So that's what she's talking about, recreating uh, a select committee. I support that. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to be recommending that people look back at all those hearings because we had um, just about every leading expert in the world, including Ban Ki-moon, the head of the UN come in and testify before the committee to say that there's a global consensus on it. Uh, but we then showed how the economics of it worked. So yes, I do support it. And, uh, and it's something that hopefully, again, will build on what the record that we already built. We lost in 2010. You want to hear this? Want to hear how bad it was? We lost in 2010. The first thing John Boehner announced, and I, in a perverse way, I'm kind of proud of this, is the abolition of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming that I was the chairman of. They don't punish ineffective people, so I'm proud of it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's time for it to be reinstituted. Thank you, sir. Over here, yes? George Mokri, I've been publishing a free weekly that looks at what's happening at the colleges and universities. Can you speak up just a little bit more? I've been publishing a free weekly online. Great about what happens at colleges and universities and in the local community about energy and other events. All of your talk has been basically about energy and efficiency, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But we also have to talk about the drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere and the elimination of other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. There is a book, Drawdown, with 100 methods I prefer, well, I also believe that geotherapy, the use of ecological systems to do the same kind of thing mm -hmm. is important. Are you aware of this kind of stuff and what are you going to do in order to regulate it and legislate it, which is mostly agriculture and forestry? Well, inside of the Waxman Markey Bill, we built in $5 billion a year and it was going to be used to compensate um, the people who lived inside of the Amazon, people who lived in Indonesia, to reduce their economic necessity to tear down the lungs of the planet that 
actually serves as the place where uh, uh, carbon is stored on our planet. So that was a big part of our plan, not just to think nationally, but to think internationally. Uh, again, we passed it. It was thinking in a way that would ensure that we would also give incentives for farmers uh, to move to no-till farming, um, to give incentives uh, for tree planting. Uh, the estimate was that it would be the largest single planting of trees in the United States since the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. That's what Maxwell Markey was going to result in. All of these being places where carbon would be stored. And when I say carbon, I mean all greenhouse gases. I can, you, you can all go. I'll just say methane. I, some of them have, like, it's like so polysyllabic, there's nine syllables in, in it. But you all know what I mean. I'm, we're using that as the shorthand for all of these greenhouse gases. But thank you for what you do, sir. Uh, and I am familiar with it, and it's something that we have to uh, encourage um, here in our country. And I think as we move along, and we got, farm, we got the farm community to endorse the bill, by the way, because we were giving incentives to them, financial incentives, to move to no-till farming. You know, again, we were looking at the industry, saying, what do you need, and how long will you need, and what kind of incentives will you need? So it was all part of a package. We wound up with the Edison Electric Institute endorsing the bill for reducing greenhouse gases. We had the Nuclear Energy Institute endorse the bill, not just Google and Facebook and the Silicon Valley companies or the cool um, non-fossil fuel countries, com companies around here, but we were moving to the future and we have an even bigger coalition now when Walmart is saying they're gonna use their ruse for solar. You know, when companies that uh, you know, have seen the light over the last 10 years, they're now in as well, so it's getting bigger and bigger as each year goes by. Yes, sir. department here developing uh, future propulsion technologies Beautiful. for aircraft. Uh, so I think we'll, we, we need to develop more efficient technologies, but at a particular technology level, how do you reconcile the fact uh, that economic growth uh, and more human productivity is probably at odds with cli reducing our climate impact? Uh, ah, that's kind a good of question. How do I, Thank you, you so, mean that there's a, that there's a, yeah, that there's a battle I, between the yeah, two? Yeah, I'd just like to elaborate oh, okay. kind of in the uh, reduce, reuse, recycle message. Um, the reduce message seems to me like a bit of a political non-starter. It's very difficult to tell people we need to reduce consumption or reduce uh, kind of up the size of our economy. So do you think one day it will become politically viable to push that message? Or how, you know, how do we get around this issue? Politically viable? It already is politically viable. We already have fuel economy standards. It already became a law. We already have appliance efficiency standards. Uh, no, and I mean, people don't have less air conditioning. It's just more efficient air conditioning. You know? And then companies compete to provide the lowest cost, more efficient. Uh, Same sorry, thing my, my point is that yeah, okay. yeah, even, even with the, we can do these efficiency savings, but fundamentally the biggest savings are by asking people to reduce the amount they use, reduce travel, or reduce right. the amount they use air conditioning. How do you do that? I appreciate that, but I think, honestly, the smartest way to go is to use the government to say, um, here's the goal. This industry must meet it. It's up to you to use whatever innovation you have in order to meet the goal. Then the winners will ultimately be the ones that are selling those products. That's what we do in the digital world over here. You don't know who the winners are. There were a lot of people competing with Amazon in that space in the late 90s, and they won. Look how efficient they are now. So my view is that you can preach that you should use less. You can preach that you should turn off the lights. But if you want to work wholesale, you're just going to tell the industry, make all air conditioning 50% more efficient. Right? And that's just going to reduce it dramatically. The same thing is true for lighting. The same thing, lighting and air conditioning are right at the top of the list of the biggest electricity, you know, consumer, uh, consumption. So, so my, my, if I understand your question, and I may not, I might be misinterpreting it, but I think that um, we can use the best of capitalism uh, to unleash the revolution, but you have to create the policies in the country. And until 10 or 12 years ago, we did not have the policy on wind and solar. We did not have the policy on automotive. We, we still don't have nationwide a policy on carbon. Although, using market forces 
New England, New York, um, Maryland, uh, and now New Jersey and Virginia, the governor of Virginia has hired one of my top energy staffers to be the Secretary of Energy and Environment for Virginia. So they're gonna join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, and then, like California, there's going to be an ongoing reduction of emissions coming out of um, the electric, uh, uh, sec electrical generation uh, sector. Uh, so that's a growing plan. It's using market forces to accomplish the goal, even as Massachusetts and New York and New Jersey have seen an incredible increase in our GDP since that law was passed in 2006. You can have phenomenal increases in your GDP while you're phenomenally reducing the amount of greenhouse gases and energy which you're consuming. You, break, you, you create a disconnect, in other words. That's our goal, the disconnect. You're going to have higher GDP and lower energy input going into it, and you just have to use market forces. And what we do with that is we then take the revenues which we raise, and then we put it into the renewable energy sector. So you're even driving uh, faster changes there. George had a big part in creating that formula here in Massachusetts. So and I, one, one okay, question, okay, yes. I'm, apologies to everyone, no, please. I'm the bad cop. Lucy, you have your left. Okay, and I apologize to, what team is that? Uh, it's uh, Stanford Hockey Jersey. Stanford Hockey. I'm going to watch BUBC Hockey tonight. Ah, oh, great. Yes, um, Lucy. Yeah, who are you, Lucy? Um, I'm Lucy Mildy. I'm an undergrad here, and I'm from southeastern Massachusetts. Um, California has made great strides in building wind and solar, but all of the cheap um, electricity during the day has caused uh, nuclear power plants to have to shut down in some cases. Um, so the Union of Concerned Scientists, among others, have come to the conclusion that nuclear power is essential to any realistic um, plan to meet our goals. How does nuclear power fit into the policies you're currently supporting? Uh -huh. That's a good question. How does nuclear power fit in? Well, nuclear power is a very expensive way to boil water. Just a very expensive way. <laughs> and you have to have a 10-mile emergency evacuation plan built around the boiling of that water. And so if you are a utility executive and you're thinking about building a new 500,000 megawatt plant, and it's 2018, not 1978, that is not before Three Mile Island, um, the marketplace is unlikely to move dramatically in that direction unless there are federal loan guarantee pro programs for the construction of that plant, meaning that the utility will have a loan guarantee from the federal government. Now, Adam Smith is spinning in his grave so fast thinking about that federal loan guarantee for a nuclear power plant to be built that it would probably qualify for a loan guarantee as a new energy source, uh, all that energy being spun up by Adam Smith. But um, the, so my feeling is this, that, and, and, and I'll take your question just as a way of talking about something. So we're now up to seven to 8% of all electrical generation in America is now wind and solar up from 1% just 10 years ago. We're adding 1.5% every single year. That's 20,000 megawatts a year. That's why we got to keep the tax breaks on the books. That's why the states have to keep their standards on the books. If you add 1.5% every year, including 2018, out to 2030, 1.5 times 13 is, uh, I guess that's about 20. So if you add that 20% more, to the 8% we already have, we're up to 28% of all electricity is wind and solar by the year 2030, if we keep on the same pace we have. And there's no breakthroughs in battery technology. This is assuming no breakthroughs in battery technology. Now I'm over here at MIT, so I'm not accepting that premise. But let's just say, for the sake of the argument, that there's no breakthroughs at all. Is somebody that's gonna become the richest person in the world who makes that battery breakthrough, which is why I know there are sophomores in high school all making that their project right now uh, and trying to get into MIT on that project, right? So we're gonna make the breakthrough. Nuclear is now about 19% of all electrical generation in America. Uh, so we don't want any unnecessary retirement of those plants, but let's just say for the sake of the discussion that we can add that 19 to that 29. Now we're up to 48. 
Um, seven percent of all electricity in America is um, hydropower right now, so you can add that seven on. So that brings you up to around 55% of all electrical generation in America will be non-fossil fuel by the year 2030, at the current pace, because we're not going to be tearing down the Hoover Dam soon, okay? So that's a 55, that's by 2030 with no breakthroughs. Now, that's the climate within which the nuclear power plant industry has to work. They now have to try to figure out how do they draw the capital investment. Uh, knowing that the price of solar and wind is going to continue to drop. It's now down to two cents a kilowatt hour in Mexico, two cents a kilowatt hour in Dubai, two cents a kilowatt hour in uh, Saudi Arabia. So as these prices continue to plummet, even with wind, uh, wind uh, was 20 cents a kilowatt hour when um, uh, Jim Gordon was trying to build uh, his wind turbines out in Nantucket Sound. That was only six or seven years ago. Uh, this new 1600 megawatt project that we now have, it's down to 11 cents a kilowatt hour. That just happened in eight years, seven or eight years. So as the prices continue to plummet, it becomes a more risky decision for the kids at the Sloan School to put money into a, into a business that might cost seven, eight, nine billion dollars, and it's risky. You know, to build a nuclear power plant over a 10-year period, not over a one-year period, which is where renewables are. So it's always the question of risk for uh, over time for money. So I'm just being realistic, saying uh, that we don't want premature retirements, but we also uh, are likely, in my opinion, uh, to have big breakthroughs in technologies that the smartest people at this university are working on right now so they can become fabulously rich. And we're trying to create more Republican billionaires. But the, um, so that would be my answer. Uh, I think it's gonna be hard because no one in New England, no governor is ever gonna license a new nuclear power plant. No one in California is gonna license a new power plant. No one in Washington State, no one in Minnesota, no one in Wisconsin. So you have to be politically, um, um, uh, Realistic, you know. Mark Twain used to say uh, that a cat that's been burnt on a hot stove won't get on a hot stove again, but it won't get on a cold one either. So when they look at the history of the nuclear power industry over the last 40 years, with only four or five of them having been completed and no new states having ordered any, uh, there may be a place in Georgia or Mississippi or Alabama, but in the totality of the electrical generation capacity, with 20,000 new megawatts of wind and solar. Um, going online every single year to have 1,000, one 1,000 megawatt plant get licensed and built, or five or 10, well, by the time they finish the 10, we'll have 150,000 new wind and solar megawatts uh, over that same period of time that will have come online. So you also want to get the proportion that new nuclear will play. New nuclear, not old nuclear. That's going to continue to play that 19 to 20% role. So, um, but it's, it's, um, um, it will play a role, the little baby nukes, they're more proliferation resistant, it might be easier to license them and to locate them, but you just have to add up the total megawatts and it just won't match what's going to happen in renewables. So anyway, um, thank you Dr. Fernandez and thank all of you for everything that you're going to do to make this revolution happen even faster than it has in the past.